Thank you for joining us for another video from GoyaGroup.com. We constantly strive to come to an understanding with everyone who wishes to serve the Most High Yah. Yahweh Elohim is the name of the Creator commanded to keep for all time. If this concept is foreign or strange to you, please review our video, Who is Your Mighty One? As I'm sure we are all aware of, there are many divisions among Israel, who are Israel. And one such divide is this calendar, or the reckoning of our Kodosh, which means set apart or dedicated days, and how to, cal how to calculate them. This is the second video in the series about obeying Yahweh Elohim. The first video was, should we observe the festivals? The calendar is such a heated and complex topic that it took three parts for us to truly establish some scriptural facts. Therefore, this is the third part of the video called Understanding the Kanak or Enochian Calendar, Part 3. The first part of this video was committed to discrediting the other calendars in use. The second part was about what actually constituted a day scripturally, including the start of a day. And this third part will be about how to use the calendar of Kanak in modern times and find your Kodosh days using the parameters given by Yahweh Elohim and plotting it on a Gregorian calendar or the calendar we currently use a civil calendar. Before we begin, let's quickly recap some scripturally established facts. Number one, the lunar, lunisolar, and Gregorian or Julian calendars have no connection to the land of Yisrael or with the Yisraelites, who are the Israelites. This includes their festivals and Kodosh or set apart days. Number two, Sefer Kanuk, or the Book of Enoch, is an accepted writing of the ancient Ibrahim, or the ancient Hebrews, that was used up to the first century by the Talmudim, or the taught ones, of Yahushua HaMashiach, the Messiah. They quoted it directly, and they taught from it. Number three, the word day, or yum, means many things in Abrit, or Hebrew, and a singular day starts at sunset and ends at sunset. Number four, Yahusha was delivered up, killed, and buried on Pesach, and then resurrected three days later. He was delivered up at night, and after the rooster crows, he was impaled. They were both sunset. Three days later, you had a Shabbat, which was his resurrection. Now, with these facts established from the first two parts of this video, we can now move on to how to apply the one true calendar of the ancient Abram to our everyday lives which is currently based around the Gregorian calendar. To those who may not believe that they live on a Gregorian and are just keeping their seven day cycles or they count separately, I have to say that is not practical. Our jobs, schools, our television, everything we do is based on a Gregorian, the whole world around you. You will pay your taxes according to the Gregorian, your bills fall under the Gregorian. So since it's there, let us navigate our Kodosh days on it so that we can remain obedient. The Kanak calendar is the only calendar ever in use nationally by the ancient Abram, or the Hebrews. It is a 364 day calendar and the only calendar that never moves and has been fixed since the start of time. This is a simple script program. It is a simulator depicting a calendar and it shows the drift of the Gregorian. This calendar or this script program has instituted a 364 day system into its value as you see over there the total calendar days it is 364 30 years in the days stay st solid they stay motionless the black line represents the shabbat it is your seventh day it doesn't move stationary all throughout time all other calendars causes a drift or causes the shift out of alignment the input of the 365 day Gregorian calendar is not even taking account for the 366 days of the leap year. It is just going to focus on 365 days to show 
that the calendar will drift and has no choice but to drift using that unit of measure. So remember, the black line is representative or it is the Shabbat, it is the seventh day. And now using a 365 day calendar, you see every year it moves one. He's just going to type it out and explain it. But the point is, you can clearly see that this calendar is drifting by one each year. And this is not even taken into account. As I said, the two year drift and the leap year. Twenty years in and you're totally out of sync with what you what you were working with. Without the other day to bring it back into intercalation or into alignment, it is going to constantly drift and be totally out of sync. Now he will use a 354 day calendar. This is a lunar or loony solar calendar. There you have to use a whole month. Now this one as shown in the other videos brings your year in 10 days too soon. Because 364 minus 354 is, three, is 10. This is what was warned about in the sixth chapter of Yobalim or the book of Jubilees. It goes back the other way because it is subtracting 10 days and not adding. So every year you see it's just going 10 days out of order, 10 days out of order. And so it leaps all over, just as we explained in part one of the video, it'll go through all, all the years of the Gregorian, or all the season of the Gregorian in 33 year cycles. That is a Kabbalistic number. Just as the first part of the video explained, the drift caused by the 365 day Gregorian or the 354 day lunar will cause drift. It doesn't matter which version you use. They both cause the drift. Only 364 days are constant and unchanging. Why is that? Let's get into it. As stated in the previous video, we're going to explain why this drift does not occur with the 364 day calendar. It's solely due to the intercalary days. There are four intercalary days, which are four anchors of the year. Intercalary means to, it's an adjective, and it means to bring a calendar or a cycle into alignment with the sun. All right. Uh, February 29th is the intercalary day of the Gregorian calendar. It is a 366 day that they add to correct their drift. Leap month is the intercalary month for the lunar calendars. It fixes their drift by adding an entire month. The intercalary days of the 364 day cycle are fixed. They never move. They stay perfect. These four intercalary days have always had meaning to the ancient Ibrahim as they signify specific events in the establishment of the world before and after the flood as per two witnesses. Sifar Yobalim, or the Book of Jubilees, is the first witness to this, of the seasons being kodosh, or sacred, to the ancient Ibrahim. Verse 23, and on the renewal, or new of the first, and on the renewal, or new of the fourth, and on the new, or the renewal of the seventh, and on the renewal, or new of the tenth, are the days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons, and the four divisions of the year. They are written and commanded as a testimony forever. And Noah commanded them for himself as feast for the generations forever, so that they have become a memorial to him. And on the renewal new of the first, he was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that day, the earth became dry and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the renewal or new of the fourth month, the mouths of the depths of the abyss were closed. And on the renewal anew of the seventh, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were open, and the waters began to descend into them. And on the renewal anew of the tenth, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account, he commanded them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever, and thus they are commanded. These renewals are the four divisions of the year or the equinoxes and solstices, which mark the changing of the seasons with signs. They are observed in the sky just as commanded. They occur the day prior to the start of the first month, the fourth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month. And you can see them just by looking at the sun, uh, just to observe it. 
So both equinoxes are going in the same pattern of path. That's why there's only one represented in this illustration. But at the highest path, you have summer solstice, the longest day. The sun is the hottest. The sun is the highest in the sky. At the lowest path, you have winter solstice. That's winter. The sun is lowest. It's coldest. Debris Hayamim Aleph, or 1 Chronicles 23.1, is the second witness of the renewal or changing of seasons as Kodosh, or sacred, to the ancient Abram. It reads, And at every presentation of a burnt offering to Yahuwah on the Shabbat and on the renewal and on the set feast by number according to the ordinance governing them regularly before Yahuwah. Third witness, Ezra or Ezra, chapter 3, verse 5. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offering and those for the renewal or the new and for all the appointed feasts of Yahuwah that were set apart or Kadosh and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to Yahuwah. These renewal days are not actually Yahuwah's festivals. As explained, they were ordained by Noah. He set them in place and they were established for his generations forever. Now, if anyone is reading New Moon there, keep in mind that the word used is Chodesh or H2320. And it means new or month. If this concept seems strange to you, please watch part one of our video for clarification. Also, please make note that there are ordained days according to Noah testified in Yobalim, chapter 6, as well as the appointed days of Yahuwah testified in Waikra, Leviticus chapter 23. As stated in part one of the video, the word used there is assumed to be Chodesh by the translators, but its root is Chadash, which means renew or new, and possesses the exact same letters as the word translated as Chodesh. Ket, Dalet, Shin are the letters. The vowel sounds are assumed based on usage originally, but was switched to the Nikud by the Masoretes, who tell you where to place the sounds. So if you don't know how to read for yourself or understand the language, you're victim or you're held hostage to whatever the translators want you to think. The letters are Ket, which means wall, fence, separate. Dalet, it means door, pathway, entrance. Shen means eat, destroy, or cut. Therefore, the word literally means the wall or separation, that is the door or entrance to the consummation or cutting of the season. These renewals commanded to be kept are the four days which were first ordained by Noah to be kept forever. As stated before, these are the four days of remembrance for specific days signaling a wide swath of things that happened specifically to the people before the flood and after the flood. The first day of spring and the doorway to the first month was when Noah was commanded to build the ark as well as the day the earth became dry after it all ended. The first day of summer and the doorway to the fourth month was when the openings or caverns of the abyss were closed so the waters rose on the earth. The first day of fall and the doorway to the seventh month was when the openings of the deeps were open and the waters drained. The first day of winter and the doorway to the tenth month was when the waters receded to the point where the mountains were visible again. These days each represent an equinox and solstice and are markers for the year. They are anchors that never move and were confirmed by Yahweh Elohim after deliverance of the eight people from the deluge or the flood. Bereshith or Genesis 8.22 is just after the flood ends, Noah makes his offering and he's speaking to Yahuwah. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Seed time is autumnal or the autumn equinox. That's when you plant your harvest. Harvest time is the vernal or spring equinox. That's when you reap your harvest. Winter is the winter solstice. Summer is the summer solstice. These are the seasons that will bring in cold and heat and night and day in their proper times until the end of this world. The patterns of the equinoxes is also laid out clearly in scripture. Tehillim or Psalms 19, chapter 19, verse 1 reads, the heavens declare the esteem of Elohim, and the firmament shows his handiwork. 
Day to day utters speech and night to night reveals knowledge. The sun and moon communicate each through their respective functions. Verse three, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It's because the whole world hears them. There is no culture that does not know of the sun and the moon. Verse four, their lines have gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Their lines are the patterns, just like the tet and ta, going over the earth in their courses. Verse five, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. A circuit is like running around a track. That is a circuit. They run their circuit and the heat of the sun, nothing is hidden from it. They complete their course after they enter the first gate. The calendar was given to Kanak or Enoch by the Malik Uriel to keep the proper order of the luminaries until the end of this world and the start of the world to come. The calendar given to Kanak is the book of luminaries. This can be found in chapter 71 or chapter 72, depending on your version or translation. R says 71, so that's what we'll go with. So chapter 71, verse one, is the first verse of the book of luminaries. It reads, the book of the revolutions of the luminaries of heaven, according to their respective classes, their respective powers, their respective periods, their respective names, the places where they commence their progress and their respective months, which Uriel, the Kodosh Malak, or set apart angel who was with me, explained to me, he who conducts them, the whole account of them, according to every year of the world, forever, until a new work shall be effected, which will be eternal. This account given to Kanak is by the Malak or the angel who actually conducts them. So he would know. It is also in a place until a new work will be created, which will be eternal. This new world to come, that is the kingdom, that one we, just, we were just speaking about. That is the kingdom of Yahusha HaMashiach, the Messiah. His new world that will be replaced in this old one, that will overwrite this. So as long as this one is in place, this is our system. A study of the language helps greatly in understanding how this calendar functions so that we can plot it out in a bit. You have to understand the culture of people to understand their thinking. So you get their frame of reference or how they're trying to make inferences. So let's focus on a couple of letters of a breed. The main box is the whole alphabet or the Aleph bait of Hebrew beginning with Aleph at the start, ending with Ta at the end. Hebrew goes from right to left. So we're focusing on Ta and Tet. The letter Ta is the mark or sign, and it is a T and represents the four quadrants of the year by spring, summer, and fall, and winter, and each corresponding to a point of the cross. So this is it in modern Hebrew here. That is the ta. It's not tav. It's ta. So this ta, the four points of it, all correspond to each of the intercalary days. This is the origin of the cross or a T. And people use it for a cross of worship, but it's really a zodiac cross in nature. And has, has to do with the constellation. It doesn't have anything to do with what people think it does. The other letter is the tet. That's this one. The tet is the earth or surround it is an x inside of a circle which is like this little x-men looking thing right here it's probably where they got this symbol from and it represents the earth separated into four quadrants in respect to direction of north south east and west both of these letters correspond to the calendar given to Kanak by the malik Uriel. the year is broken up into four equal parts which are seasons each season has three months of 30 days that end with the renewal day or a changing of season day that are the intercalary days. These four days are the anchors of the year that never move. They keep your year locked down perfectly and they are not reckoned with the count of the year but are added at the end of the year. See for Canuck or the book of Enoch chapter 74 entails these four days. Verse one reads, these are the leaders of the chiefs of the thousands, those which preside over all creation 
and over all the stars with the four days which are added and never separated from the place allotted them according to the complete computation of the year. These four anchor days, they never move. They never slide. They'll always be in the proper place, which is why we use them for intercalation. These are the four days added at the end of the calculation of the year and never move. Verse two, and these serve four days, which are not computed in the computation of the year. Respecting them, men greatly err, for these luminaries truly serve in the mansion of the world, one day in the first gate, one day in the third gate, one in the fourth, and one in the sixth. And the harmony of the world becomes complete every 364th state of it for the signs, the seasons, the years. So every 364th of the circuit or the revolution, the courses that the sun, he runs his course and the moon, she, she follows hers too. Every 364th state of it, as it traverses through these gates, completes the year through the signs and all the seasons. Now, there are two very important pieces of information in those verses. The first was in respect to the use of the renewal days for your calculations. Using these four days of intercalation in respect to the calculation of the year causes error because of the drift. Let's apply some simple math to explain this and show this drift. If you take 364 days and divide them by the 12 months, it gives you 30.33333333 forever days per month. That is not even, and it will cause a drift, just like you saw on the simulation program used before. It's going to move everything out of alignment. So your festivals and everything, they will not sync up with the intercalary days. But if you do not calculate them in your years, however, and take 360 days divided by the 12 months, it equals a nice clean 30 days per month. Smooth, perfect, even every year without fail. The 360 days divided by the 12 months and you add the four days at the end gives you your 364 days per year complete state of it. The second vital piece of information there is in respects to the gates. There are six in total that the sun traverses through. These six gates are the basically the courses of the sun it makes throughout the year. So we see the first gate here, one, two, three, four, five, six. These six gates were created representing each day or yom. Each date was created on a yom of creation. Whether you view that period of time as a literal day or as a period of time, there were six of them. And the seventh day, no work was done, which is why they stop and you go into the seventh day, which is your Shabbat. These six gates represent the courses of the sun and the, at times the moon, which is a check for the sun. And if we utilize C for Kanak, these things become clear. So the sun basically starts at the first gate at its beginning and it goes through its course or a cycle like a strong man running his race goes all the way around until it gets to a peak up here. And this is the solstice going all the way back around to it hits another equinox, finishing off again at the winter solstice. So you have two equinoxes and two solstices. The first one of the year is the spring or the vernal equinox. The sun goes through each of the gates, which until it hits the summer solstice, which is the highest point of the year as shown in the other illustration, the longest day. These gates are elevations of the sun. Winter solstice is the lowest elevation at gate one. Summer solstice is the highest elevation at gate six. With a little bit of visual information, let's now refer back to Sefer Kanak, the book of luminaries, verse three. I beheld the gates from where the sun goes forth and the gates where the sun sets. Kanak is informing us that he sees the gates where the sun comes out to rise and the gates where it goes to set. Verse four, in which gates also the moon rises and sets. And I beheld the conductors of the stars among those who precede them. Six gates were at the rising and six gates at the setting of the sun. This is informing us that there are six gates for rising and six gates for setting. There are multiple windows on each side of them, but there are only six gates, elevations, but there are one side to rise and one side to set. Verse five, all these respectively, one after another, are on a level and numerous windows are on the right and on the left side of those gates. These gates are all on level with each, with each other 
and are surrounded by the windows that represent each month. Let's move down to verse 11 and it reads, and in the fourth gate through which the sun with the moon proceeds in the first part of it, there are 12 open windows from which issues out of flame when they are open at their proper periods. The sun and the moon will rise from the fourth gate, which is the beginning of the year and called the great gate. So they'll rise at the same level in the fourth gate or the fourth elevation at the beginning of the year. The book of luminaries confirms this great gate. Verse nine, in the same manner, it mean the sun goes forth in the first month by a great gate. It goes forth through the fourth of those six gates, which are at the rising of the sun. This is the course that we showed before the course of the sun and through the gate that it rises and sets for 30 days at the start of a year, which follows the last day of the year. That is the vernal or spring equinox. The book confirms this in verse 41. At that period, the night is contracted in its length. It becomes 10 parts and the day eight parts. Then the sun goes forth from that second gate and sets in the west, but returns to the east and rises in the east in the third gate, 31 days setting in the west of heaven or Shamayim. This is the last month of the three month cycle that comprised the winter season. The 31st day of the third month of winter or the day after the last day of winter, the 30th day is a renewal day, a doorway into the first month. It begins the new season. In this case, spring begins. The sun rises and sets with the moon for 31 days in the third gate. Verse 42, at that period, the night becomes shortened. It is nine parts and the night is equal with the day. The year is precisely 364 days. Equinox is Latin for equal night. Therefore, this equal day and equal night period is definitely an equinox. The ancient Ibrim or Hebrews divided their days into 18 parts or hours, making nine parts of day and nine parts of night a full day. We'll go over this a little bit later in detail, but for right now, we're just trying to get you to understand the concept of how Kanak reckon time. We see that both equinoxes occur when the sun and moon rise and set in the third and fourth gates. So we have the third gate here, your fourth gate here. What we just read was the sun going from the second gate into the third gate. And it stayed here for 31 days. That is the 12th month, the last month of the year. That is that elevation. Then it rose up and went to the fourth gate. And now begins the first month. This is proven in the following chapters of Canuck, which detail of the regulations of the moon. Chapter 73 of Sefer Canuck, verse 5 reads, On stated months, it, being the moon, changes its settings, and on stated months, it makes its progress through each gate. In two gates, the moon sets with the sun. In those two gates, which are in the mist, in the third and the fourth gate, from the third gate, it goes forth for seven days and makes its circuit. The gates that are in the mist or the middle are the third and fourth gate. They're between one and six. You have two and five. Then you have three and four. This phenomenon of the sun and moon rising and setting together occurs four times in a year for periods of 31 and then 30 days. And they are signs that mark the spring and autumn equinoxes respectively. The year ends with the spring equinox which marks the start of the first month of spring. Then the autumn equinox marks the beginning of fall and the start of the seventh month. When we go back to the book of luminaries, which is chapter 71, verse 24, this confirms this. It reads, the sun goes forth from the fifth gate as it sets in the fifth gate of the west and rises in the fourth gate for 31 days on account of its signs, setting in the west. At that period, the day is made equal with the night or equinox in Latin and being equal with it, the night becomes nine parts and the day nine parts. This is a different view just to explain the levels of the gates. So when you look at this, you clearly see that there are six gates all on level with each other. You have six gates on the west and you have six gates on the east. And these six gates are just elevations. So the first gate 
or is the sun's elevation. This is the lowest elevation. This is the sun. That is the winter solstice. The sun continuously gets higher throughout the season. And when it goes from the second to the third, it stays there for 31 days. And that begins the equinox. That goes into the fourth gate and it stays there for 30 days. The moon and the sun rise and set together for this period of time as a sign. Then it goes to the highest point all the way to the fifth gate to the sixth point at its highest point in the sixth gate, which is the summer solstice. So the verse we just read was it coming back down after it reaches its peak. Then it goes from the fifth gate into the fourth gate and it goes there for 31 days. And after that, that 31st day is a equinox, the autumnal or autumn equinox, then goes into the third gate for 30 days on account of those signs. This is how you know when you're at the changing of the middle of the year. And these gates are in the mist. They're in the middle of the six gates. Jews use the autumnal or autumn equinox as their Rosh Hashanah or the beginning of the year. That's the third gate going into the, or the fourth gate going into the third gate. That is totally wrong. The third gate going into the fourth gate is the vernal equinox in spring. And it's beginning of the year for you. Just as told in Shemot, or Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This is also further confirmed by Sefer Kanak in the calendar or the book of luminaries. Book of luminaries or chapter 71, verse 17. The sun now returns to the east, entering into the sixth gate and rising and setting in the sixth gate 31 days on account of his signs. The reason the sun sets into the sixth gate is due to its signs or marks. Verse 18. At that period, the day is longer than the night, being twice as long as the night, and becomes 12 parts. The sun traverses through months of 30 days each that end after the season of three months. So you have 30, 30, 30. That gives you 3, 6, 90 days. Then on the 31st day of the third month, We'll use this illustration as an example of late spring. You have an intercalary day or a renewal day, which is a new season day. The first month of Abib, which is the Pesach month, began, which we just read, after nine parts day and nine parts night. Or when the day is equal with the night or an equinox, Latin for equal night. This began the season of spring. This was an intercalary day. At the end of spring, Late spring, the 31 days, you have another intercalary day. So three months after spring started, you have another season. This is a doorway or kadash renewal into the new season. After your 12 parts day, six parts night, you begin summer. That was your summer solstice. And you go for 30, 30, 31, and you reach another intercalary day. Or at that point, it'll be another equal night or equinox. Nine parts day, nine parts night. And what we see is this is the pattern of the entire what we were talking about before about the tet and the ta. So looking at this, this is a ta. That is your T. Each marks or each uh, mark of the T equals a intercalary day. Each point signifies your season. And the entire thing, the entire circuit of it equals your tet. That is your containment. That is your whole year right there. Four equal quadrants, four intercalary days, broken up equal parts, seasons of months of 30 days each. The sun, moon, and stars were created as a sign or a mark, tall and tet, to utilize for the determination of Yahuwah's appointed days as well as other days. This is confirmed in Bereshith, chapter 1, verse 14. Then Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Verse 19 reads, so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The sun and the moon and the stars not only divide the night from the day, they are for signs and for seasons as well as days into years. This was done on the fourth day. These six gates correspond to the paths of the sun and the moon, with the fourth gate being what we call the equator. So you see four right here. This is the equator going all the way around the earth. 
The sun and moon make their circuit all the way around the earth and they come together when they get to the third going into the fourth and when you get into the fourth going into the third. So on their way in, they meet and on their way out, they meet. Each of these gates correspond to a day of creation. The first one being the lowest elevation of the sun because the sun is on this widest circuit away from. So take people who live in North America, for example. This is North America right here. And I, for example, live on the East Coast. When the sun is in its first gate, this is the lowest elevation because it is winter for me. That's winter solstice. The fourth gate is representative of the fourth day. The calendar of Yahuwah is based on the number seven, the number of completion. The entire 364 days of the year divided by seven days per week equals 52 weeks perfectly. Each gate or intercalary is a season with each season lasting 91 days. 91 divided by seven equals 13 weeks perfectly. Now, after all this, we should have the necessary information to plot our calendar as well as the calculation of the seventh day Shabbat. Since we have now confirmed scripturally that the sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day or the fourth gate of creation, we can easily determine our weekly Shabbat, which is three days later after that on the seventh day or the day of rest after the sixth gate or day of creation. But before we do that, we must first confirm when these intercalary days occur without having to rely on others to tell us or the use of the internet. We understand that the elevation of the sun is key to determining the season, but how are we sure that these are the proper seasons or intercalary days used in ancient times? First, let us look at some ancient civilizations. These are just a few megalithic structures or giant structures that witness the equinoxes, which means they are large structures that we cannot duplicate today and are unsure how they were originally created. The first witness is the Menagerie temples on Malta. There are three structures built over long periods of time going back to about 3600 BCE. The buildings are all that remains of a larger compound and the lowest temple was used as an astronomical and calendrical site, cooperating with the equinoxes and solstices with the spring equinoxes sunrise being the entrance of the lower temple, shining light through the main passageway and into a small shrine within the complex. The second witness is El Castillo, also known as the Pyramid of Kukulkan. It's a 79-foot steep pyramid at the center of ancient Mayan site of Chichen Itza. It was constructed around 1000 CE, and the structure creates a visual effect during the spring and autumn equinoxes. During the equinox at sunrise, light hits the pyramid at an angle, creating the appearance of shadow that resembles a gigantic snake that slithered down the pyramid steps. Third witness is Stonehenge. This is one of the more famous of the Gentile megalithic structures, and I don't believe the Anglos built it, but I digress. The point is that it displays an effect during the equinoxes that shows the sun setting between specific pillars. Last year, there were thousands who visited the site for the spring equinox. They all mark the vernal or spring equinox on March 20th each year. Next, let's calculate the intercalary days for ourselves using observations of the sun's patterns and time to determine its various elevations, just as our ancestors would have. The sun traverses through the year in somewhat of a roller coaster pattern. As you can see, this is the line of the sun. It starts at winter and rises and increases elevation throughout the year and it hits an equinox, then goes all the way to its peak until it hits a solstice. Then it declines again until it hits another equinox, which is the autumn equinox, and goes all the way out until it hits winter again. This is your patterns of the sun. We, anyone can observe it. It's right there. No one can hide that. This is using an image to give you a visual representation of how the sun should look to you. So that roller coaster pattern you saw in the sky, that's it right there, arching over you. Its highest point is when it's the longest day when the sun is in the sixth gate or the summer solstice, where the daytime is to be twice as long as the night, and it's at its lowest during the longest night, which is the first gate. So this is winter on the side. Coming here, you have your vernal equinox or your spring equinox getting higher and higher and higher till you get to your peak. Then it starts going down and you have your autumnal or fall equinox getting lower and lower and lower till you get to winter. Then starting all the way over again, 
raising and lowering. That's what's going on the entire time. Now that we understand the positions of the sun, we need to calculate the time in order to ensure our accuracy. This requires a standardization of the Gregorian reckoning of time with the Kanak reckoning of time. We all understand a day should be 24 hours. This means that at 60 minutes per hour, you end up with 1440 minutes or 1440 minutes at the end of those 24 hours. A day to Kanak is 18 hours. This means in order to maintain 1440 minutes to establish the same unit of measure, we must make each hour or part 80 minutes in length, 24 hours per day at 1440 minutes per day and 18 hours per day at 1440 minutes per day. So when looking at Kanak's reckoning of time, this should clear a lot of things up about his calendar or the calendar given to him by Uriel. Back to the Book of Luminaries, which is chapter 71 of Sefer Kanak, the Book of Enoch, verse 25. At that period, the day is made equal with the night and being equal with it, the night becomes nine parts and the day nine parts. This is the autumnal or fall equinox. Nine parts day and nine parts night equate to 1440 minutes divided by two, which is 720 minutes. That represents nine parts or hours of day at 80 minutes per hour. 80 minutes times nine hours equals 720 minutes or one half of a day. Therefore, your day should only be that long, 720 minutes. When we take 720 minutes divided by 60 minute hours, it equals 12 hours, which is half of a 24 hour or equal day and equal night. The spring equinox functions in exactly the same way. This is the circuit, the cycle, going from gates one to six, starting over and over and over again. Back to the book of luminaries, chapter 71, Sefer Kanak, verse 31. Then the sun goes at that time from the second gate as it sets in the second gate in the west, but returns to the east, proceeding by the first gate for 31 days and sets in the west in the first gate. This is the end of a season as the sun heads towards the first gate for 31 days. The first and sixth gates mark the two solstices in the same way that the third and fourth gates mark the equinoxes. The second and five gates are transition gates between the intercalary days. Verse 33, at that period, the night is lengthened as much as again as the day. It is 12 parts precisely while the day is six parts. This is the longest night and the night is twice as long as the day where the sun is at its lowest elevation in the first gate. Now we're going to have to apply some more math again. 12 parts or hours of night at 80 minutes per hour equals 960 minutes. Six parts or hours of day at 80 minutes per hour equals 480 minutes. If you divide that number by 60 minutes per hour, it equals eight hours. This means that on the winter solstice, you should only observe eight hours of daylight. The summer solstice works in the same way, just inverted so that it should only be eight hours of night and 16 hours of day. Back to Sefer Kanak, the book of luminaries, chapter 71, verse 35. The sun has thus completed its beginnings and a second time goes around from these beginnings. After the winter solstice, the sun completes its circuit and starts over on the other side of the west, which makes sense when looking at a diagram and understanding the terms. Verse 36, into that gate it enters for 30 days and sets in the west on the opposite part of heaven. We encourage everyone to perform their own calculations independently, but we have done the math and it confirms the assessments of the megalithic structures. Vernal or spring equinox is March 20th. Summer solstice is on June 21st. Autumnal or fall equinox is on September 22nd. Winter solstice is on December 21st. It's not a lot of trickery there. I know it, people think that, well, that's, that's what everyone else does. Those are the intercalary days. All the ancient civilizations knew and it checks out if you actually do the math and use the observations for yourself. Now that we have accurately nailed down the proper fourth day of creation, which is the vernal or spring equinox, 
we can easily deduce our weekly Shabbat and our festivals. Since the equinox is on the fourth day, three days later, we will experience our seventh day Shabbat. Therefore, March 23rd or three days after the vernal equinox is always a Shabbat or a Sabbath, as the 20th is always the vernal equinox, which is the fourth day, making the 23rd the seventh day. There are other witnesses to our Shabbat as well. The leap year or intercalarial correction of the Gregorian calendar adds a 366 day in February, making the month consist of 29 days instead of 28. That extra day added to correct their drift will always be a Shabbat. It is a hole in their exquisite math, which we'll still address momentarily. Since March 20th is the last day of the year, or the 364th day, and the 21st is the first day of the first month of Abib, the first day of the year starts on the evening or sunset of March 20th. So at evening of the 20th, sunset starts the first day of the year, and that evening on the 21st, that begins the second day. Then 14 days after the vernal equinox, you have your Pesach which also falls on the middle of the week or the fourth day. This brings us to the last witness for the Shabbat. Then we will explain the drift or the shifting days in greater detail. The last witness is the resurrection of HaMashiach. In the book of Matthew or Matthew chapter 28, verse one, we read, but late in the Sabbath, as it was dawning into day one of the week, Miriam or Mary from Magdala and the other Miriam came to see the tomb. This translation of the book is just one of the multiple accounts of the resurrection and the cornerstone of the Holy Roman Catholic Churches or the HRCC's Sunday doctrine. They claim the Messiah was obviously resurrected on Sunday, but a closer examination of the original Greek text, which the English version was translated from, reveals the truth. The phrase day one of the week is used in multiple passages of scripture and is translated from the Greek phrase Mion Sabaton. Mion is Strong's G1520. It is an adjective. It is transliteration haste. It means one. Now, someone will say, well, that means one or first. No, protos in Greek is first, as in prototype. Mion is the numerical value or one. Sabaton in Greek is G4521. It is Sabbaton. It means a Sabbath or a week. That's exactly what it is. The proper translation of the phrase is one of the weekly Sabbaths. Instead of translating one, it was mistranslated first. And instead of translating weekly Sabbath, it was mistranslated of the week. In the same capacity that the Masorites purposely mistranslated words to promote their moon worship, this too was intentionally done to allow the HRCC to move the Sabbath of the week to the first day of the week, Apollo's day or the sun's day. This is why Constantine came in there with Sol Invictus, the unconquer unconquerable sun. This is easily verified through textual analysis. When we examine Maasim or Acts chapter 18, verse four, it reads, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. That's G4521 and persuaded both Yehudim and Greeks. In Lucas or the book of Luke, chapter 13, verse 10, we read, now he, being Yahusha, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. That is G4521. Greeks 4521 is the word used in these verses and the one before. And the word means Sabbath or Shabbat. It is the same word used for the day Yahusha's resurrection in Matthew Yahu or Matthew. Since we know that Yahusha was resurrected three days after Pesach, which is the 14th day of the first month, this means he resurrected on the third day of unleavened bread or on the 17th day of the first month, which was a Shabbat. Just as the original language of the text suggests before men and religion got a hold of it and twisted it to form their doctrines. Now that we have the validity of the four renewal days, the weekly Shabbat and all subsequent festivals, which fall in their proper order without fail, we can clear up why the days seem to be moving when they should be fixed. First and foremost, before we go anywhere, please understand our 364 day calendar does not move. 
their days move around ours as witnessed in part one of this video when displaying the drifting dates. The reason for this drift is that the 365 day a year consists of sidereal days, which are about 23 hours and 56 minutes and four seconds. The days are not 24 hours of 1440 minutes, but rather they are 1436 minute days. This is a crafty deception and one that I don't honestly believe was constructed by the enemies of Yisrael without help of supernatural forces. But I'm going to refocus. The way that the world has kept Yisrael from observing their festivals and Shabbat, as well as renewal days, is directly through this deception. They remove four minutes from every day to create a 365th day. Four minutes isn't a lot of time, but if you add it up over the course of a month, you get 120 minutes every month. Then take that 120 minutes and extrapolate that over the course of a year, 1440 minutes. 12, 120 times 12 equals 1440. This is the day of Bacchus or Bacchanala. It is all also called Dionysia in Greco-Roman religion and represents any of the several festivals of Bacchus, who is Dionysus, the wine G-O-D. It is also called the Eyes of March and is supposedly the day Julius Caesar was betrayed and killed as well. This inserted day isn't real. The Gentiles have taken four minutes from every day to create a made up day. This is like taking one inch off the bottom of a blanket to sew it on top of another one for the creation of a longer blanket. That's like a Native American proverb, I think. It cannot ever work as they are attempting to stuff a 365 day year into a 364 day cycle. And thus that calendar has to be corrected with leap year every four years for intercalation. This extra day of March 15th moves their whole calendar over by one day each year as 365 minus 364 equals one and by two days in leap year because 366 minus 364 equals two. This is why the day after March 15th is always a Shabbat as well. The inclusion of days will typically fall as the seventh day due to the nature of the calendar's base system of seven. So as you can see here, the Shabbats are moving they're all in the same day. They're also right here. They're all in that same day. This day does not exist. They just added it. If you remove this out of the equation, they will line up perfectly and be together. All of this may seem like heavily uses of the sun and that's not by accident. This is how we were supposed to calculate the years, Sabbaths and the festivals. This is validated in Sefer Yobalim or the book of Jubilees chapter two, verse nine. And Elohim appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Sabbaths and for months and for feasts and for years and for Sabbaths of years and for Yobalim and for all the seasons of years. Now when, we, now when we observe a functional calendar, all of those moving parts will line up perfectly. Let's plot it all out. After you observe the season of winter or 91 days after the winter solstice, you experience the vernal equinox that checks off. The extra day added of February 29th is a Shabbat that checks off. The day after the eyes of March or March 15th is a Shabbat. The vernal equinox is the final day of the year and has 720 minutes of light and dark. And the next day is the first day of the first month. Check. Three days after the vernal equinox or March 23rd is a Shabbat. Fits perfectly. The Pesach or Passover falls 14 days after the last day of the year and falls during the middle of the week. Check. Three days after Pesach or the 17th day of the first month is a Shabbat. Check. The ninth day of the seventh month will be a Shabbat followed by the 10th day, which is Yom HaKippur or the Day of Atonement. All of it fits perfectly without fail. There is a calendar attached to the website GoyaGroup.com with a link in the description of this video that we have put together with all the dates corresponding to the Gregorian calendar in order to align the festivals. We hope this information was useful and that we were able to clear up some things. Also, please do not take our words for this. We are just men like anyone else. 
please independently verify all the information presented in this video. And please leave any comments below. Thank you for your time and shalom.